We start with a song. Welcome to Community Church. Music. Oh, music right into it yeah please There's no heaven It's easy If you try And no hell below About us Only Hello, everybody. How are you? It's Dean. I am uh, the music director of Community Church and also the uh, interim administrator. And I don't know if you noticed that I we panned onto the mantelpiece behind Olena Glotova, who is our musician this morning. And there were two toy cars. Why would I talk about toy cars in church? Well, because I love amazing coincidences. Um, there were two toy cars on the mantelpiece. And it just so happens that I've been in Los Angeles for a week, uh, cleaning up, clearing out my late friend's apartment. He passed away in February. And um, one of the things I brought home and that came in a box today to Community Church, I arrived here. One VW bus and one VW bug. And if that's not a friggin' weird, bizarre, amazing coincidence, uh, I don't know what is. Um, but there it was on Olina's screen, and we welcome Olina. She will not be with us live because she is a uh, classical and jazz pianist and singer uh, from Ukraine, from Kharkiv, Ukraine, and she is on a cruise ship right now. Um, and the internet is very bad. I've had a lot of conversation with her, and uh, sh and I will talk about her more later in the program. I thank Alan Clements for uh, steering us to Olena Glotova, who is our amazing musician this morning. So welcome, and um, I have a candle lit for my friend Jim Thomas. It's a candle that came from his house, and uh, I don't. I wish I could uh, zoom in on it, but it is a candle of the Virgen de Guadalupe. Jim Thomas was half Mexican and an avowed atheist, but was also totally obsessed with all things uh, Catholic. And um, 
and uh, all all beautiful Mexican imagery of of um, of the, the Virgen de Guadalupe, that amazing virgin who appeared to um, a, a native man and and proved that you didn't have to be a European colonizer virgin that 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 it was a new world or or. That's a wrong uh, misnomer too, right? Phenomenon, and and that you could take the religion that was um, foisted on you by the Europeans and turn it into your own beautiful, amazing thing. And Mexico has certainly done that. And I I just uh, loved finding some things that Jim was obsessed with, and that. Uh, that defiance of death and that laughing at death as in little skeletons i got to i got to bring these up to the camera to show you i just have to so you can you can see I think this last one is my favorite. It's the cross, the symbol of death and capital punishment, but it's painted in bright, beautiful uh, springtime colors um, as, as a way to defy death and, and cover it with, with springtime growth and flowers. I wish you a happy spring. I wish you a happy Eid to the Muslims and, and to the members of Muslims for progressive values who meet in our space here. Um, and come and see the rest of, of Jim Thomas's tchotchkas sometime. He also um, uh, inherited, we also inherited from Jim a, a beautiful addition to our incredible uh, collection of photography books that are on the third floor. Uh, beautiful, huge coffee tables, uh, wonderfully printed books of early 20th century photographers, and also um, a huge collection of poetry. Um, so I just remember Jim Thomas on this, on this morning. Um, our subject today is Ukraine, and I remember all of those from both sides, and especially the civilians who have lost their lives in that war and so many other senseless wars. Um, and, and I want to show you one final Jim Thomas item uh, to defy that grim reaper death until it finally grabs you. I also, as per the suggestion of Mary Lynn Kramer, want to um, invite other folks who want to do this uh, uh, morning candle lighting and dedication to, to please um, do that. Um, and this is, while we're still on the subject of passings, two more to show you. I was not here for Mel King's memorial, but um, 
my colleague Crystal and her husband Reggie were there, and I saw it on on online, and it was a, a beautiful tribute. Speakers like Michelle Wu and um, Maura Healy, and our beloved Byron Rushing, who has spoken here many times. Uh, it was a wonderful tribute, and I invite you to go to the YouTube uh, and and hear those those speeches. We we miss Mel King. Uh, finally. Um, uh, next Saturday is a, a memorial service for John Mannheim. Um, John Mannheim was uh, a member of Community Church in, in heroic standing, did so much for this church over many years that has spanned the 80s and the 90s, was president, was vice president, was treasurer for many years, and was clerk as well. Um, John Mannheim, his, his memorial service is this Saturday, and I'm interested in getting uh, a delegation from Community Church to go. It's in Concord, and I'd be glad to help give, give rides. If anybody's interested, please be in touch with me through the church or through email, dean at deanstevens.com. That's next Saturday. Um, there's another announcement about next Saturday in the evening, and that is our new annual uh, ritual or, or custom, which is to have a peña. Peña is a Latin American style open mic event with food and dancing and poetry and storytelling and, and whatever you wanna do to get up and speak. And you don't have to be from Latin America. It can be in any language you would like to share. Uh, but the focus is, is Latin America, I suppose, because Encuentro Cinco is the sponsor, and Encuentro Cinco, when they lost their space, came to live with us here in our building. And what, what did we get from it? We got three marvelous Latin American uh, members and board members as well, represented our Mexico, El Salvador, and Costa Rica. And of course, your, your, your host, who is a fake Costa Rican, uh, born of gringo parents in Costa Rica, uh, I suppose I'd call myself that somehow. So um, uh, that's the Pena, Saturday night, uh, April 29th. I want to tell you that we have a new newsletter. Thank you, Crystal Rollins Jackson, for the newsletter. It's always a relief and a pleasure to be able to, to present this, which has two months worth of our programs. And it's just a, a beautiful graphic design setup. It has concerts. It has, the, of course, the Pena. It has uh, a, a lovely Earth Day uh, announcement about the event that happened two days ago. I was not able to be there, um, but uh, I heard it was a, a marvelous, a marvelous thing. Earth Day in love and rage, and happy Earth Day weekend, by the way. Um, as I have come to know this world from the moment of my birth until the day my life is done, I'll pledge allegiance to the Earth. Earth flag behind us. Climate change is real on the other side. Um, and uh, in the middle, our banner, all welcome, all races, all religions, all cultures, all, <laughs> all genders, all orientations. I didn't place that uh, too well, but uh, it's, it's there. Finally, another announcement before I talk about our musician. Um, we have completely filled out our petition to uh, free the Holy Land Five, and we are uh, we have signatures all on the back and all on the front, and it's it's basically um, in support of our 2022 winners of the Sacco and Vanzetti Award, the Holy Land Foundation Five, five Palestinian businessmen who got stuck in the war on terror, uh, innocent men who who started a foundation that uh, that after. 2001 was perceived to be terrorist because they gave children's aid, uh, supplies and medicines and uh, toys to children in Gaza and the West Bank. This is a, a petition to free them. We'll start another one and we'll 
keep on sending petitions of this sort to our decision makers until they are free. Three of the five are still in prison, serving long, long sentences, and we've developed a wonderful friendship with them. They are now our three new members behind bars, and uh, there's been several letters from them. You're welcome to come and read those letters. We have this poster that, that says, Free the Holy Land Foundation, five and uh and we'd be glad to share some of these with you as well so when we started thinking about a program about ukraine alan clements our president suggested olina glotova who he had met in china alan is a frequent uh traveler to china for business and family reasons and um and he had heard Olina in China. And um, I've spent some time with her. She is not live today because she is on a cruise ship that has very bad internet. We have texting back and forth. Once we were we were together on a on a on a Facebook Messenger video call. But besides that, I need to introduce her and we will show. Um, some of her music is um, this is the part that we call the musical message. I will tell you that uh, Olina is from Kharkiv, Ukraine, and um, from an early age was was precocious at the piano, and um, and went on to study classical music at several um, institutions, uh, prestigious um, universities, and with several. Um, prestigious teachers as well, including, um, is it the, the the daughter of Vladimir Horowitz and um, and others? Uh, and she sent me this, it's very long, I can't do it all be, because it's, it's it's her whole, her, her entire <laughs> resume. Um, but um, she also talks about her family, which um, fled from Kharkiv, um, both her parents and her grandparents who are 90, 91 and 93, and they were able to get out under really just harrowing, awful conditions. Um, and um, are, some of them are now in Germany, and, and others are still in Kharkiv. And so um, that's, that's the, um, the little background to Olina's amazing music. She has quite a history, both of, of classical performance as well as what we'll hear, which is jazz. Um, and just incredible interpretations of, of both popular songs and standard American songbook jazz. So um, uh, we want to hear from Olina now. This is our musical message. It's a, two songs uh, together in, in, a, um, in a, a medley. <laughs>
Olena Glotova. I hope I said her name right. It's a beautiful name and a beautiful, talented Ukrainian pianist and singer of depth and emotion. Uh, I'm, I've been talking back and forth with Olena from the cruise ship in the Caribbean where she is, uh, where she is working and works every day. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, I dreamed with her. Um, we had one one video call together, and I dreamed with her about having her right here in this room playing the beautiful piano that is behind these banners. Uh, that uh, we're just developing a really nice um, catalog of piano concerts. On a, you can find them on our YouTube channel, the likes of Tim Ray, or most recently Jacqueline Schwab, and maybe someday soon 
Olena Glotova. Uh, we just have to get her to Boston and um, I, I will personally drop everything and host a concert of the, the incredibly gorgeous music of Olena Glotova. And she apologizes for not being able to introduce herself uh, live, but um, you get the drift and we wish you well and your family uh, well in that really difficult circumstance Olena, and uh, we wish you safe, safe travels on the cruise ship and uh, rewarding, um, rewarding tips <laughs> Is that you, and, and experiences. Um, so uh, before I introduce Svidlana, I'm going to walk to the camera and show you one last little, little skeleton from my dead, my late friend, <laughs> departed friend, Jim Thomas. I noticed on the bottom it's labeled sugar skull. Do you think I should lick it to find out if it's really made out of sugar? I, I don't think I will. I, I think it's it's a nice little piece to have on a, on a mantle somewhere. Um, well, um, again, a happy Earth Day weekend to all of you and a renewed dedication to each one of us individually and collectively at every level, be it the church level, the city level, the state level, and the federal level, and the planetary level to do everything within our reach to reverse the climate emergency tragedy. Um, and we're doing our little part here at Community Church. Step at a time, we're making this five-story building uh, that we have in Copley Square a more energy efficient, hopefully at the end, state of the art model for similar buildings in the city of Boston. Uh, we have uh, taken the first step by replacing our oil fired furnace with all heat pumps on all five floors, uh, heat pumps that are electric, which is um, one step. Electricity is not completely clean yet, but you can um, choose clean electric options. They're more expensive, but we have we've done that as well. So um, step by step, maybe soon we will have solar panels on our roof to provide more electricity. Uh, that's a little bit uh, of a tough sell to this thing called the Back Bay Architectural Commission that has very strict um, uh, laws and guidelines about what you can't do and what you can do uh, all the way to the color of paint and the and the and the nature of of your your construction remodeling everything is very tightly controlled but i think that these panels could even be invisible from the street so maybe we'll be able to have a um an array of of panels on our roof someday soon um, that's a little little taste, and we welcome you to to uh, be involved in in our attempt to turn our asset here, which is which is this building, into um, something that's not only more comfortable to us and to our uses, which is about radical organizing and reshaping of society, but as well uh, uh, to energy efficiency, uh, comfort, but efficiency on a planetary level. It's, it's been pouring down here and that sometimes scares us because it's an old building and we get flooding when a lot of rain comes down all of a sudden in the basement. Uh, that's another whole problem that we have to take care of, very expensive. A um, lot of things to take care of in, a, in an ornery old building like this, but, uh, but we're getting there. Um, and we say that by way of, of introducing Svidlana Romanko. And I don't have um, Svidlana's um, uh, um, uh, resume in front of me, but I'll tell you what, um, what I do know is that I read an article that she wrote with Bill McKibben that was in the Los Angeles Times. 
and it um, impressed me enough that that um, I said that somebody from such a difficult um, geography in the world at this moment has saying things like that is just really amazing. Let's try and see if she will join us. And she said, yes, yes. Thank you, Svidlana. And after that, um, I saw Svidlana interviewed by Walter Isaacson, who is my favorite uh, avuncular. Um, that means like your like your uncle um, interviewer on PBS. And then I saw recently a, a video of Svidlana being arrested and ushered away at the COP27, um, which kind of reminded me of our wonderful hero. Medea Benjamin, who uh, gets uh, gets in those kind of situations all the time in Washington, D.C. Medea Benjamin, who won our uh, 2016 Sacco and Vanzetti Award. And it made me think also that I wish that Greta Thunberg had been with you to do the same. Her analysis of the COP27 uh, said it all for me, not just the Russian Gazprom delegation, but all the oil companies that are representing represented there. Shame on you and shame on Gazprom for even having them in the conversation. And Greta Thunberg's quote about the whole thing was, was perfect. More blah, blah, blah. And so that's that's what I want to say from this end, and uh, just welcome with open arms, uh, Svetlana Romanko to uh, to deliver our address this morning at Community Church of Boston. Thank you, Svetlana. Yes, thank you so much, Dean, for inviting me, and uh, just to be, uh, briefly uh, uh, tell who who I am. Um, in addition to what you said, yes, I am a climate activist and I've been quite active since the war against my country started um, back to last year. But also I am a doctor of law, environmental law and the climate change governance and climate policy. And I've been teaching in the university for 15 years before I became an activist uh, after being an international expert on environmental law and climate change law as well. And I've been working for... Um, 350.org and for Loud Out the Sea movement, uh, who, who, uh, whose name was a global Catholic climate movement. And I've been working with many regions in the, on the planet um, to see enough of social injustice and climate injustice and really wanted to do something about it. And of course, we could not imagine ourselves to be in the place as we are now over one year um, during atrocious, the most violent war on the planet, as I would say, uh, because last April we've known about massacres in Bucha, Irpin, and uh, later came Mariupol and other destruction, and the war is still raging on, and we do all, all possible and talk to many people across the globe, trying to find the solidarity uh, and uh, end this war altogether, but uh, my frontline was a fossil fuel addiction and now i am go um, that feeds russia's war machine and putin's war machine and now i will uh, try to uh, show you my presentation where i uh, will walk us through the uh, campaign how it started and our activities because i established rather we stand um, Ukrainian-based organization active internationally in April last year to support the Stand with Ukraine campaign that was calling for ending fossil fuel addiction, as I said, that feeds Putin's war machine and seizing all investments into Russian fossil fuels to economically end the war and dry Putin's war chest. I will try now to switch the present, uh, switch on my slides. Um, yes, and I think I will be completely able to share my screen and you will see what I what I'm going to uh, talk talk with you today uh first so let's just discuss not just the grim side of the war which is the death destruction and violence and terror but also a solution side uh, what happened what happens when we will be able to rebuild and when we defeat Russia's regime and Putin's regime as well. Uh, just saying um, a bit more who we are. Uh, 
as an organization, as I said, Razum We Stand is a quite young organization, a grassroots organization calling for a total and permanent embargo on Russian fossil fuels and immediate end to all investments into Russian fossil fuels. Um, and uh, we act to push the fossil fuel phase out and uh, uh, both climate and anti-conflict action in many political spaces in countries, because we know that fossil fuels feed war and conflict in every part of the world. And the war against Russian war against our country, Ukraine, is not uh, just the first fossil fuel war on the planet. Uh, there were more wars in um, Southern Sudan, Libya, Nigeria, Angola, and many others, Syria, of course, and many others, and we definitely can see interconnection between fossil fuels and armed conflict. And with a big uh, aim to to defeat uh, Russia's Russia's aggression, we aim to liberate all other nations and inspire them to fight against fossil fuel autocrats, exactly as we do. And we also promote a clean energy revolution and global accelerated push for renewables. Uh, because as we believed uh, many months ago, and now the IA director of Fatih Birol just confirmed in the multiple reports and op-eds that um, the uh, rebuilding of Ukraine on a clean energy could become a showcase for a global renewable energy transition. And we must do this and not to lose the chances to see our country rising from, from the war ashes, the more beautiful that it has been and more energy efficient, uh, powered by renewable energies and uh, also inclusive and just for everyone in the country. And we also work to establish politically represented ambitious green recovery plan for Ukraine that can catalyze the global momentum for change. And we also network and engage the overall movement and uh, how the world can help in general um, renewable energy to help us uh, to run the renewable energy revolution and rebuild Ukraine in green. Uh, first of all, it just immediately stops spending money subsidizing fossil fuels because almost 11 million each minute goes to pub of public money goes to subsidies for fossil fuel industry and enterprises and many of them are still in Russia and um, uh, namely as uh, Baker Hughes and uh, Schlumberger which are infrastructure oil and gas infrastructure companies based in the US but also many others and uh, world leaders must stop business as usual with Russia while subsidizing fossil fuels and create hu creating huge profits for companies exporting them. As we, as we got known last year, uh, fossil fuel companies has earned enormous profits, the, the, the most uh, best profits in history. Um, and the, this, that has happened because they have used a narrative of the Russian war against Ukraine to enrich themselves. And they tried to, to barrage a whole range of propaganda, trying to, to, to showcase that uh, it's not possible for us to, to switch to renewable energy sources. And we need to explore more oil, gas, and coal, which is not true. And we work to uh, actually uh to to debunk this narrative uh because that's that is not true ukraine and europe does not need uh more gas or oil all we need are solar panels heat pumps and also wind wind powers and renewable energy uh, renewable energy capacity so we need to start spending money on clean energy revolution and not even us individuals but also governments and first and foremost so has to be has has to be governments because they have uh, public money to decide and invest, but also um, we claim on private investors to spend money on clean energy, not to, to invest them into fossil fuels. Because um, last year, uh, yes, fossil fuels were profitable, but it won't. This effect it it won't last long because the government's politics and policies are changing, and we can even see the European Union is trying to change their policies to consume less oil and gas, and especially from Russia. 
uh, because it's immoral. This is not ethical anymore to to buy resources, fossil fuel resources, and enrich the country, which uh, uses the terror and attacks and neighboring country, independent and sovereign country, with the armed forces and and commits atrocities on its territory towards children, senior uh, people, and also uh, women and men and everyone. And so next step will be to invest in clean energy now. Uh, when in the past, I've been working uh, quite well alone on divestment from fossil fuels, but uh, I would also encourage to divest from fossil fuels, but also everyone who is listening to us and has some funds probably invested into them, but also not just divest, but also invest them, reinvest them into the clean energy because it will save the trillions of public of public um, uh, US dollars, euros, and the, the different national money in the future. So going back to the historical background, how that's all started, as I've already mentioned, Russian uh, war machine has been uh, funded and fueled by oil and gas and coal industries. And uh, Existing political and economic systems grounded in fossil fuel dependency have enabled deep social and climate crises that have proliferated conflict and wars fueled by revenues from fossil fuels. Europe and others are still helping uh, to line Putin's war chest by sending hundreds of millions uh, of dollars every day to Russia for its oil and gas. But we were able to halve this amount of money because back all together campaigning many organizations from all over the world and uh, we've been able to to halve the, those illegal profits and uh, especially and when back in april last year we could see that putin earns 1 billion us dollars equivalent each day to run the war against Ukraine, and they are very rich with getting all this money. That now, as of end of February, um, their profits started being 500 millions per day, which is still a lot. And we work to 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 dry these financial flows at all. But political change and especially banning Russian fossil fuels is not going that fast. We've been able all together as a climate movement to achieve uh, and to demand from the European Commission and European officials and achieve uh, actually a coal embargo, um, oil embargo on Russian oil and also petro products uh, embargo on um, crude oil uh, products as well. But what we can see right now is that there are loopholes in the sanctions. And uh, the next thing we did, we applied with a letter to the special reporter on sanctions in the, within the EU and to the US Treasury um, trying to request from them uh, that all loopholes in sanctions must be closed and Putin must not own the dark fleet of maybe of already 600 of uh, different different vessels that are carrying out um, oil illegally uh, to one country and another mostly to Greece to the refineries where so this oil is transporting uh, from under different flags and this is definitely uh, must be must be um these loopholes must be closed um for sure and as we see that 87% uh, of Europeans want massive investments in renewable energy. And we just need to continue both sides. We need to pressure on embargo on Russian fossil fuels, but full embargo and real embargo, because there is no gas embargo still in, in spite of our efforts. But recently, the European Union is going to adopt the 11 sanction package. And we hope that... Uh, uh, gas embargo uh, initiated by Poland and Baltic countries will be enforced within this package and we send appropriate letters to the EU commissioners and um, EU ministers of energy as well. And I would like to bring a bit of spotlight in a climate sense and also in an anti-military sense that Russian carbon bombs, the undeveloped fossil fuel reserves, further threat uh, to Ukraine and to the world. Uh, they have many, uh, just a few facts, few facts on my left, there are 41 carbon bomb fossil fuel projects in Russia as of 2022. And what do we mean by carbon bomb? Carbon bomb is a field of um, uh, with a huge potential of emissions, which is not yet being explored. And we can see these numbers are really huge. 
23 of those carbon bombs, oil and gas fields had not yet started extraction with the potential lifetime emissions of almost 120 gigaton of CO2. And 19 projects are operated by Russian companies as Gazprom, Novatek, Lukoil, Rosneft, uh, and Tatneft, and are backed by foreign finance. The projects are predominantly in oil and gas extraction also. Nearly a third are coal and include projects in Siberia and the Arctic as well. The project with the highest potential emissions is the Hasprom developed Yamal Mega Project 11.2. Uh, gigaton of CO2. And United States uh, was the biggest investor in Russian carbon bombs uh, as of 2022, with over 150 institutions that uh, invested um, almost 24 billion of US dollars in investment. And Qatar, which is, we see all, it's also undemocratic country was the second largest investor in this margin, major carbon bombs polluting projects with investments of 15 billion U US dollars. This was all invested in Rosneft and was held by Qatar Investment Authority, making it the biggest single investment in Russian carbon bombs. And as far as I know, this money are still there and we, uh, they are blo blocked currently because um, within the Russian government and resolutions of the government, investors cannot take this money out of country. But I think that everything is possible. And when the stock exchange will be open and there are some ways, legal ways to, to divest those money from fossil fuel enterprises from Russia uh, and uh, stop its its war machine finally because uh yeah, russian economy is collapsing we've got a few reports um back to the last year uh saying that uh, almost one third of russian economy is now being uh, uh is it, it has been a decline and there will be more decline in a few next years if the consumption will decline as well of russian fossil fuels because 60 percent of the economy was based on fossil fuels and of course um this is a system uh system and structuring um uh, profits for the state budget and uh, about uh, we see this picture of destruction and unfortunately all of this destruction to my biggest regret it's real and in my country there is even more and every day every day young people and different people are return returning back home never alive and they will never be able to hug their lovely ones and i think that those who did it must be held huge must be held accountable strictly accountable and especially uh those who run russian carbon bombs and putin in particular but all his all russian all russian officials and authorities uh, this is a huge cr war crimes that have been committed over the territory of ukraine and towards the civilians and 90 percent of attacks of russians target civilian infrastructure and hospitals and you know, residential buildings and schools and theaters, which is unacceptable and unbelievable as well. And um, we, it's just not one crisis uh, that we've been seeing, a crisis of peace, but also we've been seeing other crises that Russia's war against Ukraine put us in and clim exacerbating climate crisis with more emissions from missiles, uh, but also food crisis, also energy crisis. And um, those institutions from the US and other countries who are still keeping investments into Russian fossil fuels must realize that doing business with Russia is currently immoral and, uh, immoral and illegal. Uh, I just wanted to bring you a sense of uh, how many more we have of those fossil fuel autocrats or dictators, as we call them, after we defeat Putin's Russia. And the data saying that there are 52 nations that are still under authoritarian regime ruling the country. Three in Latin America South and South America, 27 in Asia and in the Middle East, and 22 in Africa. And just to bring uh, and our overall purpose as the reason we stand is to create a global movement to fight fossil fuel autocrats and dictatorships and uh, 
uh, drive a clean revolution in Ukraine and, and globally. And just to highlight, the Stand with Ukraine campaign has become really big and global, and I organized and launched this campaign with many organizations from different parts of the world in late February, uh, beginning of March 2022. And this campaign was backed by almost 900 organizations because uh, not even those numbers, 870, something we have of them from 60 countries calling upon governments to ban all imports of fossil fuels from Russia and rapidly phase out fossil fuels everywhere. And later we had a letter signed by 75 global organizations ask this invest, asking investors and insurers to seize all new financial services to Russian fossil fuel companies and stop supporting Putin's war, which is propped up by fossil fuels. And uh, what we uh, just some data of destruction, which I will just skip as of now, but as I said, 97% uh, infrastructure civilian targeted and um, uh, almost 500 strikes aimed at energy infrastructure facilities. We had our our total black blackout in November 2022, and the winter was uh, quite hard for Ukraine um, in particular because we had extreme power outages and we could have had just two hours of power supply in the whole day in 24 hours and we used to live with no power uh, most of times and uh, i can say that uh, the way that we try to pave to towards energy efficiency and clean energy has started over this hot winter when our households were struggling with the energy poverty but also access to energy and right to energy but our country was doing uh, no, was doing okay before the war started. And uh, uh, I'm saying that uh, being mindful that we try we tried to get some increased climate goals and also creating additional space for economic recovery and for renewable energy transition and renewables uh, took a share of 13.2% in our energy mix. And uh, we've been on a good track, but now, since the war started and until now, the economic decline is huge and projection, projections are even more awful. So uh, general economic um, GDP reduction is uh, now, it just not predicted. It's proved that it's uh, 45, uh, 35%. And by the end of this year, it's been expected to be by 50% as well. And the total damage to physical infrastructure, uh, which means roads, bridges, um, housing, and um, a lot, of, and actually environment, because uh, one third part of our environment uh, is being destroyed. And um, no one knows what is happening on the occupied territories where there were unique natural reserves. But we, and oh, of course, um, mining of the territory is uh, a huge problem because um, as uh, on those territories that became uh, liberated after Russian invasion and occupation, they are all mined and it will take years to get those mines and diffuse them uh, from, from, from the depths. Um, and um, we we have a huge need to uh, to to involve some uh, investors into rebuilding our country when the war is over, when we will defeat Russia and Putin. And um, for now, this number is more close to 1.2 trillion of US dollars equivalent, and we can see that it's really a huge number of uh, amount of money which we will need to to find um, to find. Uh, from somewhere as well um, and uh, just how we did what we did else during COP27 what you've mentioned today Dean are uh, not just uh, confronting some Russian officials as I did saying them that the they are terrorist country and they are killing and torturing and violating our people for almost nine months back to then and their oil and gas is killing us and killing our climate 
And uh, we also met with the Federal Minister for the Environment, Nature, Conservation of Germany and asked for her support in Ukrainian green rebuilding. We also met members of the European Committee of Regions who are official representatives of different European cities and made our plans of how to connect cities of Ukraine with the cities in Europe and trying to get them exchange and get help from European cities to rebuild. And we also met Ambassador Jeffrey Piat, uh, who is the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Energy Resources. And we currently received response uh, to our letter to him. And he promised he was quite optimistic about U.S. supporting um, Ukraine in rebuilding. And also our activities on Ukraine's recovery and green reconstruction were participation in international expert conference on the recovery, reconstruction and modernization of Ukraine in October in Berlin. It was first conference and I've met Ursula von der Leyen and Olaf Scholz and our Premier Minister Denis Shmihal and talk to them about the green recovery of Ukraine and try to get them committed to rebuilding Ukraine with clean energy. And also we have, has held, uh, have held a press conference on green recovery principles for the reconstruction of post-war Ukraine in October. It was prior to the high-profile conference and virtual roundtable are leading the way out of climate and energy chaos. How can Ukraine's green recovery unlock rapid decarbonization of the European continent with Bill McKibben as well? And how, uh, finally, coming to the end of my presentation, how the world can help us at the moment. Of course, uh, immediate help is to uh, stop funding Putin's war crimes in Ukraine and Russia's war crimes in Ukraine and, and um, seize all investments, all financial services and impose a strict ban on Russian fossil fuels everywhere. This is where we must, we must continue and we must not uh, weaken the sanctions because otherwise the uh, regime of uh, terrorist Russia will prevail and we don't want to see the country in the center of Europe dying under Russian aggression. And we are incredibly resilient and resistant as a nation, but there is a thing that well certainly can do to support us on the second year of this war. Uh, of these horrific war. So first of all, what we would like to do as a climate and energy campaign is to build popular involvement to the global movement to end the fossil fuel era and wartime mobilization to revamp energy transition globally. The second we would like to do to double pressure on the US, EU and J7 governments, the most rich countries in the world, as we know, to effectively enforce the global energy sanctions to reduce global fossil fuel supply and demand. We aim to forge a powerful and compelling green revolution pathway for recovery of Ukraine's economy and make it as a global showcase. And Europe can achieve the goal of becoming the first climate neutral continent in the world, but only with Ukraine leading the way because Ukraine is the largest country in Europe and having no Ukraine involved into the Green Deal plans, which we know European Union has, uh, cannot be successful. And to make the EU's climate, energy, transport and taxation policies fit for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we need to have Ukraine as well involved and uh, being a candidate of the uh, European Union membership as well. And Ukraine can certainly become a renewable energy powerhouse and aims to completely become carbon neutral uh, within the EU by 2050. And uh, Ukraine's Black Sea offshore wind energy potential of 251 gigawatt almost reaches this goal that Euro European Union just planning for to, to achieve by 2050. And also um, Ukraine has a huge potential within the solar and wind capacities across its own territory. And key areas of our uh, transformation and to becoming a new green economy and peaceful economy are uh, rapid development of renewables and replacing fossil fuels and helping the EU to reach the European deal, European Green Deal goals, developing smart city mobility networks because uh, 70 to 80 percent of emissions, CO2 emissions in the cities, there is a transport emissions, um, restoration of buildings according to the best energy saving standards 
pumps, replacing gas boilers with heat pumps, as I what I started with, of domestic production and industrial transition to zero emission steel production, and uh, maybe I uh, green hydrogen, but it's not yet proven technology, and we need to make to do a more research what green hydrogen is and might be become a new green force for powering our homes and um, economies. We will just need to clarify that. And in the past, we called for a green Marshall plan for Ukraine, which means economic development based on the coupling um, macro macroeconomic indicators increase while environmental pressure decrease, and also decrease of waste generation, air and water pollution, and improving quality of life, investment in green infrastructure. And of course, integrated infrastructure and clean industrial development planning for modernization of post-war Ukraine. Um, as I said, it's uh, estimated uh, about one trillion of US dollars as of December, but now I believe this cost is much higher. And um, uh, our uh, our country president and his office is working with the BlackRock Financial Market Advisory and World Bank with the financial support. But of course, we would like to have this transformation being um, built from the bottom up, from the cities and from the affected communities that are now being displaced or are suffering the most of losing their homes. And of course, we have to take those interests into account to achieve not only green rebuilding of Ukraine on completely clean energy, but also achieving climate justice in the future. Thank you so much. These are my contact data. Please follow us on social media. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you, Svitlana. Am I on? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Svitlana. Um, say no to fossil fuels. And uh, to us in the United States, uh, the same. We have uh, an administration who has given out more gas and oil leases than in the first two years of the Trump administration. Um, cut up your credit cards uh, from Chase and, and um, Citibank. Just some initial ideas. There's so many more things each one of us can do. Um, but what we need to do is listen to more of Olina Glotova. First, I'll tell you that we depend on your support. I have put in the chat the, um, the website for the church. There is a PayPal and a credit card function there for you to help us do what we do, building community here in, in the heart of the city of Boston uh, and, and beyond. Um, so we, we're going to end and thank Olina and Svidlana for joining us this morning with one last song uh, from Olina, her album that is called Summertime. And um, we're just so grateful that you were able to, to give us the information and join us from uh, a cruise boat on the Caribbean. And, um, and we hope to be able to receive you and host you for a, a live concert here at Community Church in, in Copley Square, Boston. Again, Olina Glotova, this song is called, you've heard it before, Summertime. Time. And the leaving is easy, 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 easy. The fish are jumping, and they got an his eye. Oh, your daddy's rich, and your mama's good looking. So I 
cries, little baby, don't you cry. Don't, don't, don't you cry. One of this morning, you're going to rise. I've seen it. Then you spread your wings and you take to this guy, and then you take to this guy, what do this guy? But until that morning, there's nothing can harm you. With your daddy and mommy standing by, do do da 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 No, don't go for Grubhub. Go for Olina Glotova. Um, that is just a remarkable uh, interpretation of an American classic by a, a Ukrainian singer and piano player, 
all of that at once, not not separate. She's quite the package, and uh, I hope we will have her here someday. Thank you, Olena Glotova. You can see a lot of her work on on YouTube. She has quite a quite a channel and quite a presence of of all kinds of different things, classical and and jazz. Um, I want to tell you that we. Um, have several wonderful things going. The next is a, also a cultural event. It's um, cultural and political. It's in next Sunday, um, a, a um, talk with Ilmar uh, Lopez Gavilan, who is a world-class violinist from Cuba. He lives in New York and his brother, um, Aldo Lopez Gavilan, lives in in Havana. And the two of them uh, are, are brothers, both just incredible, remarkable players. And there's a, a film about them that we screened uh, uh, about a month ago that shows the, the troubles and travails of their being able to play together, depending on the political situation between the United States and Cuba. It's, it's a wonderful film, and we will be talking to Ilmar next Sunday and hearing more from, from him, his Harlem String Quartet, as well as his duo with his brother, Aldo. Um, so join us on April 30th. But before that, this Tuesday, we have Ray McGovern. Uh, Ray McGovern retired CIA officer um, and founder of Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. We've had Ray a couple of times before. He will be speaking on Russia and Ukraine. Uh, join us. We will put the, um, the the link to that program. This is this Tuesday, April 25, in the in the chat. Uh, can we do that, Amar? Um, and we hope you will join us. We have quite a few uh, already signed up, several hundred, I think it is, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then uh, a couple of uh, comedic Sundays. One May 7th is uh, a um, program uh, by Roger Cabler, who did a film about Robin Williams, the the, the remarkable comedian. And um, and the, the next week we have Randy Credico, who is a podcaster and 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 comedic entertainer, who has been perpetually a presidential candidate. Uh, and the, the presentation is called Randy Credico for President. I hope you will come. He will be live in person here at, at the auditorium at Community Church. Um, he is, he is in Russia right now. Okay. Um, fascinating. And um, so uh, a bunch of other things in this, in this newsletter. Um, but we'd like to open the floor, uh, uh, the Zoom especially, uh, to uh, any uh, questions or, or comments for Svidlana. And thank you again, Svidlana. And we hope we can receive you in person as well here at Community Church. Yes, thank you all too. And uh, you know that we have a freedom of speech, but I also appreciate your solidarity and respect. Uh, uh, we can exp express different minds, but I am so sure that being on the front line and with seeing what Russia's war against Ukraine is causing every day, I very much hope that in solidarity, we will be able to end this war and sanction Russia and defeat this illegal and criminal regime as well. And thank you so much for your support. Have a good Sunday. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Ha uh, any any comments from anybody? Uh, as the rain starts to pour down here at the church, hey, I'm sorry? Can I say something? Yes, Alin, who is one of our board members. Welcome, Alin. Okay. I'm a board member. I welcome you. Um, I learned a lot from your from your presentation because obviously it was triggered not only because of the tragedy that your that the area and your country in particular lives, but also because there is a genuine genuine interest in uh, combating fossil fuel expansion in the world. I'm not, uh, I was born in Central America and I live here now. And uh, one of the things that aggravates, uh, how, how do you, would you frame the unity, let's say about the activists in the United States plus the activists in Europe, in Asia and Africa, because 
we don't trust Mr. Biden at all. I think he betrayed us in every way, in every possible way. As I said in my comment, American imperialism is also very evil. But I totally sympathize uh, with the Ukrainian people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for your comment. Uh, I don't think that I have uh, really something to respond here. I, I, I know that being working with many regions on the planet before the war started, and Central America included Costa Rica, we've talked a lot, and uh, Mexico we had, and, and more in Latin America, we had conversations about how to actually defeat fossil fuels that fund conflicts in Ecuador and other countries. I know a lot about this, and I knew more before, before the war, because after the war started, I just immediately focused on helping my country, including just small humanitarian help. And I think that... Um, People make change and uh, solidarity makes change as well. And being united as a movement against fossil fuel uh, autocrats will will uh, will make us stronger and uh, will make us to, to be to be able to make a change that we all want. It's not a secret that governments, uh, of course, are uh, using um, any opportunity to support the fossil fuels. And I know. Yeah, that in the US specifically, fossil fuels are on the rise because the companies are seeing uh, the opportunities for enormous exploration and expansion on fossil fuels. And we, we've been trying to help our colleagues from the movement from the US to tackle these uh, uh, harmful developments. But um, yes, I understand. But for me, I, I truly believe that we will we need, because that can be no failure. It, in us, in with us, Ukrainians trying to defeat, uh, and will we will defeat this Russia's war machine? Because otherwise, the democratic world will won't exist. And I I I hope everyone understands this because it will be a huge shift in uh, anti democratic uh, movements and regimes as well. Thanks. Well. If there are no other questions, we will just once again say we are so grateful that you have joined us and um, we stand in solidarity with you and with Ukraine and with the planet to end the sanity of the fossil fuel, insanity of the fossil fuel dependence. And uh, we are up to the task of doing our part. Um, um, hello, hello. Eventually, uh, Excuse me, who is that? Uh, me, I have a quick statement or uh, say a question, um, if that's possible? Yes, yes, go ahead, Dan. Uh, I wish you would have put your hand up uh, before. Um, sorry, I sorry. was just making my concluding comments. But go ahead, Dan, please. <clears throat> Hello and welcome. Sorry I missed most of your speech. I just want to say that for me, I think you're in a war that both sides have evil people in power. Um, that's the problem in the U.S. involvement. I don't trust the U.S., so I understand where you're coming from, and I support you, but as an American who sees the American imperialism, it's very scary. And our goal in Ukraine and Russia, our own goal is not so clear. And so be careful of our country, of asking for our support. Be wary. We have a government, in our country is very corrupt and very evil. And so I think you're in a situation, it's a very tough situation. So I support you, I understand climate is a very, very important issue. We had a rally the other day, I missed it, for climate change in Boston and around the world. Extinction Rebellion does good things when they can to push the issue. So thank you, and I hope you understand that it's a tough situation. Thank you. I've Yeah. Uh, there was there was one more from uh, Rudiger. Yeah. Go ahead, Rudiger Volk. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed very much, uh, Dr. Romanko, your, your presentation. And it seems that you are really have a global uh, viewpoint of it and also a local viewpoint in terms of Ukraine. Um, I'm a German-American and I can tell you, which nobody knows, <laughs> that Germany, um, uh, first of all, uh, is the first country on the earth who went out of atomic energy, but fueled the electricity with brown coal, which is the worst energy source which you can think of. Uh, uh, second, that welfare recipients in Germany, and this is 8 million people in one of the richest country on earth, get free gas. Um, and so my question to you is, um, what do you think? As I mean, uh, I'm talking about Germany as, an, as a really uh, very democratic and, and, and uh, uh, social uh, government. <clears throat> uh, what do you think about the world dictatorship in terms of um, uh, environmental concern that, um, that uh, like uh, Den Haag uh, court gets um, put over the earth um, in terms of that any kind of uh, kind of government as an, an, uh, an extra uh, ordinary government or, or institution uh, which um, punish and support um, the earth basically um, thinking that we are uh, right now eight billion egoistic uh, entities on earth no? so I mean I, I don't see um, I don't have uh, some hope that we can uh, cope the, um, the climate change. Uh, thank you for your answer. Mm, I believe, uh, yes, we are many individuals, uh, but, you know, problem is not um, to that extent in individual behaviors. As it is, we understand that consuming energy might be much more efficient than it, it, it has been over those years by individual consumers. But at the same time, I would like to highlight that uh, these are governments who are investing, who are just feeding fossil fuel industry with the public money of the taxpayers. And I, I must also say that the big investors, mainly, they are mainly based in the US uh, uh, as a Wall Street and all others. They are still very hopeful that fossil fuel industry will be alive and well in many years from now. And what I see, uh, but I, I can't see any point of discourage here, and I would not say that I am desperate of and losing hope for us tackling the climate crisis as a humanity. No, uh, I'm an opposite. I truly believe that we will be able to do it, and I am very inspired to work with my colleagues in many parts of the world doing impossible possible because you know uh some, someone someone famous has said that it seems impossible until it's done and all we can do all we can uh hope in this situation is to do impossible until it's done and we are trying to do the same thing in regard to uh the russian war against ukraine as we've seen because you've seen the large uh, uh, russia it's the largest country by land mass and with the huge resources i talk today about the carbon bombs and the huge CO2 emission potential. But there are more, more countries as China, uh, as the US with this potential. And our task as an activist is not to let them to become uh, a total fossil fuel autocrats. And we must defeat Russia first to, to create this global showcase of how people and how Ukraine is much smaller country, still largest in Europe, but it's much, much smaller than Russia with less, res absolutely less resources. But with international solidarity, we are resisting for, for almost almost a year and paying a very tough, a very, very high price for that. I, I wish we, we would not pay with the lives of so many Ukrainians and thousands, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of my compatriots. And uh, I believe that these, uh, these life death issues should not be sacrificed to a vast interest of uh, growing exploration and mining, extractivism, all of negativity that always accompany environmental environmental resources use. So I truly believe I'm hopeful that we can break this, uh, this uh, historical moment into and transform it into a clean energy revolution. And I appreciate Germany. I've seen this news about uh, being abandoning at uh, nuclear energy at all. Uh, yes, they are doing the right thing, but at the other side, 
uh, I've been speaking to some German officials and I asked them, why did not you impose embargo on Russian fossil fuels in last April? We would have defeated Russia back to then and we would have been we would live through this spring and summer because uh it was warm and we've been we've been able there was a momentum and that's that's what I've been speaking in Bundestag I've met a few a few officials from Germany and this is about industry and always this triangle um as, which is environment and also economy and a sustainable development and we must meet the point of all three to being equally protected by state and by by citizens as well as and then citizens and uh, consumers will move if the government creates a lot of infrastructure for us being able to equip our homes with renewable energies to afford these renewable energies to be being installed and when if, if it will become a state policy but also the most returned investments in history and we aim to really increase investments in renewables by 2030 and we encourage as a global movement uh, because we ukrainians we are part of a global environmental and climate movement and we must push for governments this is a critical moment when we a turning point if you would like to uh, so when we still can change of how we will live in the next 50 years as a humanity thank you Okay, thank you, Rudiger and Dan and Dr. Romanko. Again, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for everybody for, for joining us today. Um, find out more about Community Church. Stop by. We have an open house every Wednesday. We serve pupusas, which are our, our Salvadoran dish uh, every, every Wednesday. Find out about our, our wonderful archives on the, on the fifth floor and about our Sacco and Vanzetti library on the third floor and about our dreams about uh, greening up this building even more as the days go by. And um, again, thank you, everybody. There's information in the chat about the PayPal how to uh, how to get uh, get uh, some funds to us and everybody have a wonderful week enjoy every delicious moment of this springtime and and uh, life is too short so drink in every moment as best you can from wherever you are at whatever state you are hasta luego Goodbye. And how do you say that in Ukrainian? I don't know. Um, but it's been great being with you today. All, uh, all 25 or so of you on Zoom and another dozen or so on YouTube and a few here in the auditorium. We'll see you.